lights on. I didn't turn my lights on. I just realized it's not that dark, but it makes a little bit of a difference, huh? So, the way the light's coming in the room, it's coming through a thin, like a narrow section of my window. So it almost kind of gives like a vignette, like it's a little darker. It's kind of funny. All right. So, we are in Leviticus 25, starting in verse 23. We've got a mix of a couple different topics, depending on how far we want to go today. So, the land shall not be sold permanently, for the land is mine, for you are strangers and sojourners with me. And in all the land of your possession, you shall grant redemption of the land. So, this is kind of, maybe we should have continued going, uh, which would have probably broken this chapter up in half which would actually probably been a better division of topics. But we stopped in verse 22 last time because it's talking about how the land goes back to the previous owner. If one of your brethren becomes poor and has sold some of his possession and his redeeming, and his redeeming relative, the Goel, comes to redeem it, then he may redeem what his brother sold. Or if the man has no one to redeem it, but he himself becomes able to redeem it, then let him count the years since its sale and restore to the, the remainder to the man who sold it, that he may return to his possession. But if he's not able to have it restored to him, then what was sold shall remain in the hand of him who bought it until the year of Jubilee, and the Jubilee shall be re released and shall return to his possession. If a man sells a house in a walled city, then he may redeem it um, within a whole year after it is sold. Within a full year, he may redeem it. But if it is not redeemed within the space of a full year, then the house in the walled city shall belong permanently to him who bought it throughout his generations. It shall not be released in the Jubilee. So the idea is, is land went back, but walled houses, those are houses, those are buildings. And so it's, it's property, like physical property, not the land. However, houses of villages, which have no wall around them, shall be counted as the fields of the country and may be redeemed and they shall be released in the Jubilee. Nevertheless, the cities of the Levites, the houses of the cities of, of their possession, the Levites may redeem at any time. And if a man purchases a house from the Levites, then the house that was sold in the city of his possession shall be released in the Jubilee. For the house of the cities of the Levites are their possession among the children of Israel. But the field of the common land of their cities may not be sold, for it is their perpetual possession. And so they've got those 48 Levitical cities. So he's kind of he's breaking down how the land was supposed to remain to the people. And really the only reason people were to sell was if they were poor. And so in many ways, Leviticus 25 goes from the Jubilee in the land, but then it transitions kind of talking about what people are doing when they're poor and they need money. They might sell their land, but the land is supposed to be theirs as a gift from God. So God has provision where they, they can sell it for a season to make some money, but then it comes back to them. 35, it says, if one of your brethren becomes poor, falls into poverty among you, then you shall help him like a stranger or sojourner that he may live with you. Take no use or your interest from him, but fear your God that you may brother may live with you. You shall not lend him your money for usury, nor lend him your food at a profit. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan to be your God. And so uh, again, it's between brothers. Why would we charge interest? You know, the idea is like, it's just a loan between me and you. We're not trying to make a business profit when you're trying to help the poor. Now, it'd be interesting to compare and look into, you know, what's a business proposition versus, you know, this is lending money to the poor. Like you're not going to lend money to the poor and expect interest from them. And, and so now even worse, if they cannot afford, right, uh, they're living, they've racked up debt, they need to pay it off. Well, now comes indentured servitude, slavery. If one of your brethren who dwells by you becomes poor and sells himself to you, you should not compel him to serve as a slave. As a hired servant and as a sojourner, he shall be with you and shall serve you until the year of Jubilee. And then he shall depart from you and he... He and his children with him. He shall return to his own family. He shall return to the possession of his fathers. For they are my servants whom I brought out of the land of Egypt. They shall not be sold as slaves. You shall not rule over him with rigor, but you shall fear your God. And so it's talking about, you know, it, 
treating them differently, treating them well, but they can sell themselves into your service. They, you pay them and they can work for you and they're under your care. But verse 44 says, as for your male and servant slaves whom you have from the nations that are around you, from them you may buy male and female slaves. Moreover, you may buy the children of the strangers who dwell among you and their families who are with you, which they beget in your land, and they shall become your property. And if you take them as an inheritance for your children after you to inherit them as possession, they shall be your permanent slaves. But regarding your brethren, the children of Israel, you shall not rule over one another with rigor. So now this is an interesting situation here. What do we have going on with slavery? Well, to start, kidnapping someone was a capital offense. It was a death penalty to kidnap someone. So uh, again, there seems to be a context here of, of how these people are being acquired, why they're being acquired, and, and how they're supposed to be treated. And, and so what we find is that slavery, people working and being sold as possession and being living in different circumstances, was common all around. And what we find is it's within the context, though, of their treatment and how they were acquired and all of these things that makes it stand out different from the slavery we're used to. We did a whole thing on slavery back in chapter 21 of Leviticus. Verse 47, it says, Now if a sojourner or a stranger close to you becomes rich, and one of your brethren who dwells with them becomes poor and sells himself to, this, to a, the stranger or sojourner close to you or to a member of the stranger's family, after he's sold, he may be redeemed again. One of his brothers may redeem him, or his uncle or uncle's son may redeem him, or anyone who's near kin to him and his family may redeem him, if he's able, may redeem him. Thus he shall reckon with him who bought him. The price of his release shall be according to the number of years, from the year that he was sold until the year of Jubilee. It may be according to the time of a hired servant for him. If there are still many years remaining, according to them... He shall repay the price of his redemption from the money which was he, he was bought. And if there remain but a few years until the jubilee, then he shall reckon with him, and according to his years he shall repay him the price of his redemption. He shall pay, she shall be with him as a yearly hired servant. He shall not rule over him with rigor, with rigor over him in your sight. And if he is not redeemed in these years, he shall be released the year of jubilee, he and his children with him. For the children of Israel are servants to me. They are my servants whom I brought out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. And so here's really the big thing with all of this is we find that it has to be a next of kin, a kinsman redeemer. Goel is our Hebrew. And this person could redeem and buy this person back, but they have to pay the price for which they were sold into slavery. And we see this in Ruth with Boaz. We see this in these laws here. And what we find is that this is all uh, a picture of Jesus. See, God came as a man, one of our kinsmen, son of Adam. And, and he's our kinsman redeemer. And he had to pay the price for which we have sold ourselves to slavery to get us back, to buy us back. And so that's the idea of propitiation, that fancy Christianese word, we talk about Jesus being the payment for our sins. And so it's a cool picture we find in all of this, how the idea is, is that we sell ourselves into slavery because we become slaves to sin. And again, our kinsman redeemer, our Goel, our, our brother comes and he pays the price so that we can be set free. So cool stuff. Moving through these chapters. How many more chapters of Leviticus do we have? Not very many. A couple. A couple. 26 and 7, and then we're done. And then we'll have to decide where to go from there. Um, but yeah, that's all I got for you guys today. Short and sweet. Love you. See you guys on Monday. And until then, take care.